Ah, wow, okay. Uh, good. So, uh, thanks very much uh, for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful to the, uh, the American Academy in Berlin for facilitating this and uh, for the ESMT for hosting me here. I don't think I need to be near these things. Do I, do I need to be near these things? Huh? I have this microphone. Doesn't this work? Okay. Well, I can, I can try to stay here. Uh, uh, so thank you very much for inviting me and hosting this event. And, and it's, it's really a privilege to be here. It's the first time I've been in Berlin. Uh, so it's been very exciting to come here and, and, and talk to you today. So what I'm going to try to do in half an hour is to give an overview of the book. Uh, the book is 500 pages long or something. But you can't write a short book on such a large, pretentious topic. So, so we had to, you know, it had to be long, but we'll see what I can do in half an hour just to get some of the basic ideas across. So what's the book uh, about? The book is about comparative economic development. It's trying to boil down in a simple way uh, research that Daron Ashmodo and I have been doing for 15 years. So we've been talking about this topic. Actually, I realize we've been, we met each other 21 years ago, and we've been talking about this topic more or less all the time for 21 years and been writing papers on it since about 1996. And this is an attempt to try to take a lot of the academic research we've done and distill it into a simple framework to talk about why some countries are economically successful and other countries are not economically successful both today and also historically. So we're very interested in looking around the world today at the difference between poor countries and rich countries and sort of proposing a way to think about what creates those differences. But we're also very interested in the book in a sort of historical approach in trying to explain why we think the world ended up looking the way it did and could the world have ended up looking different in some way? Could prosperity be distributed differently in the world. I think the historical approach is very powerful for discriminating between different hypotheses of why the world is so unequal today. And hopefully a little bit of that will come out in the talk. So I'm going to explain our framework not by jumping into some sort of arcane definitions, but by actually telling you a story about the economic and political history of the Americas and using that story, which we do in chapter one of the book, to sort of extract some, some lessons, some generalizations which form the core of the book. But let me, before I start on the economic and political, political history of the Americas, let me just say something kind of fundamental, which is that thinking about differences in economic prosperity across the world today or historically, about why it was over the last 250, 300 years, some parts of the world became much more prosperous than other parts, what economists have understood since the work of Robert Solow in the 1950s, a Nobel Prize winner at MIT, is that what drives long-run economic growth is innovation. It's innovation, technical change, new ways of doing things, new goods, new products. If you go back to the British Industrial Revolution, which sort of started this enormous expansion of inequality in the modern world, what was the Industrial Revolution? It was innovation, it was mechanization of production, it was the invention of the factory system, it was the steam engine, new methods of power, transportation, the railway, that accumulated into all sorts of things. It came through the 20th century, the, the diesel engine, the airplane, the computer chip, whatever it is. It's fundamentally what creates prosperity is new ways of doing things, new good, new production techniques that just make human beings much more productive. Now, here's the thing about the Industrial Revolution. Where did all these ideas and innovation come from? Was that, you know, George III who had all these ideas? Was that the King of England? Was it some British aristocrat who came up with the steam engine? No, what's really interesting about the British Industrial Revolution is if you look at who these innovators were, who these first people, they came from all over the social spectrum. They were elites, non-elites, poor people, artisans, craftsmen, farmers, professional people. There's a very important lesson at the heart of our book from that experience and many other experiences like it, which is that talent, ideas, skill, energy, creativity, entrepreneurship are very broadly distributed in society. And if you want to have a prosperous society, you need to have a, what we call a set of institutions, a set of rules in the society that can harness all of that talent. Okay? So, so keep that thought in mind when I come back to abstracting some concepts from the comparative economic and political history of the Americas. Okay, so 
let me have a go at that. 1492, uh, Columbus discovers the Americas. The Americas is very interesting if you think about it. In 1492, you've never been able to predict that the United States and Canada were the most prosperous parts of the Americas, or would have income levels multiples, 20 times what poor countries in Central America have. In fact, the most developed parts of the Americas with the best technology, the most advanced political societies were in the Central Valley of Mexico or in Andean South America. The Incas, you know, they had built public goods, they built 25,000 miles of roads, they had famine relief, they recorded vast amounts of information on knotted strings called quipus. They didn't have writing, but they had, they didn't have money even, but they had amazing organization. You know, they even had a kind of postal system almost. They had runners that went all around the empire. So this was something on a completely different scale and level of sophistication than anything you see in the southern cone of Latin America at the time or in North America. And yet, in between now and then, there was an enormous reversal in this pattern of relative prosperity. Instead of being the richest parts of South America, Andean, uh, instead of being the richest parts of the America, Andean and South America are now very poor, and the southern cone of Latin America or North America is much richer. Where did that come from? What created this enormous change in this pattern of prosperity? Well, that's fundamentally the way that the colonial societies in the Americas got formed. So let me tell you a little bit about why colonial society got formed very differently in the United States than it did in Bolivia or Colombia or Guatemala. Okay. I'll try to do that through the Spanish colonization of Argentina. Okay? So today we think of Argentina, Buenos Aires, as being you know, one of the most sophisticated, interesting, fun parts of Latin America. That's not how the Spanish saw it. The Spanish got there, they called it the Rio de la Plata because they found some silver. They thought, hey, silver, great, this is why we're in the Americas. Uh, it turned out the silver came from far, far to the west in the Inca Empire. It had come through trade routes. It wasn't from Argentina. So they built a settlement in Buenos Aires and they tried to negotiate or with, they, they tried to enter into contact with the local indigenous people. The local indigenous people, the Churuas and the Karandi, were basically hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, they fired arrows at the Spanish. They wouldn't cooperate. They clubbed a few to death. Things weren't working out well for the Spanish. They sent out expeditions trying to find where the silver came from, and they discovered up the Paraná River in what is now Paraguay, the Guarani. So the Guarani were a large, densely populated, sedentary agricultural society with hierarchy and chiefs and tribute. The Spanish abandoned Buenos Aires en masse, moved up the river and took over the Guarani and founded what's now Asuncion, the capital of Paraguay. So what the Spanish were looking for in the Americas was indigenous people to exploit minerals to mine, okay? That created a very hierarchical, unequal society with particular structures designed to extract tribute resources, what economists would call rents from indigenous people. So if you look early on at, say, how the labor market was structured, the labor market was structured to coerce indigenous people into working for the Spaniards. What happened in North America? You're thinking, let me tell you about the history of the United States. That was colonized by British people, right? British people brought the common law, they brought liberty, they brought crickets, they brought cucumber sandwiches. This is not like the Spanish, okay? Completely wrong. The British had a model for how you colonize the Americas, and that model said, number one, capture the local Indian chief, okay? That's how the Spanish had got control over indigenous society. That's what Cortes had done in Mexico, that's what Pizarro did in Peru, it's what uh, Jimenez de Quesada did in what's now Colombia. Capture the local Indian chief. What you capture the local Indian chief, you get this huge leverage over indigenous society. The indigenous people work, they bring taxes, they bring food. This is how things work in the Americas. That was the model the British had when they got to Jamestown, 1607. So, there was a local Indian chief. He was a gentleman called Wahun Sunakok. But Wahun Sunakok was someone very different from Atahualpa or Montezuma or King Bakata. He was, he was in charge of this sort of restless group of tribes, the Powhatan Confederation. This was not a hierarchy, you know, it was, it was something very different. 
The British said, come to Jamestown. You know, come to, he was like, no, 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 you, you, I'm not going to Jamestown. You, you, he was a very suspicious chap, Wahan Sunakot. Come, you come to my, you come to me. So the first year, the British were, you know, trying to trade. They were trying to figure out how they could get control over Wahan Sunakot. The second winter, two thirds of them starved to death in Jamestown. Why did they starve to death? They didn't bother planting any crops. What's that? That's not what you did in the Americas. You didn't plant crops. You exploited the indigenous people. Okay, that was their model. Two thirds of them starved to death. Now, Jamestown was founded by the Virginia Company. The Virginia Company was a business. They were in it to make money. It wasn't a charity to spread you know, the common law. So they thought, okay, this plan of exploiting the indigenous people isn't working. We need a new plan. Let's exploit the English people. So they sent over a new governor called Sir Thomas Dale. And Sir Thomas Dale passed a new set of laws. And the first law said, any uh, colonist running off to live with the Indians is punishable by death. Now, it's very significant that that was the first clause, because the first reaction of English people to being exploited was to run off into the forest and live with uh, Wahum Sunakok and uh, the uh, local tribes. So, so the, the attempt, so the, the, after the attempt to exploit the indigenous people, there was an attempt to exploit the English people. That failed for various reasons. One is people ran away. Another was, of course, that once they realized the only way to have a viable colony was to get English people to go, it was very difficult to get more English people to come if you were exploiting the ones that were already there. So in 1618, the Virginia Company did something remarkable. And this is the origin of uh, why the United States ended up different from South America. They decided, look, this exploiting business is not working. Let's try something else. Let's try giving these people incentives. So they free people from their labor contracts. They give everybody 50 acres of land. And the next year, to make this whole thing believable, they introduced a legislative assembly and gave adult males political rights, not females. This was not the transportation of some wonderful British institution. Adult males didn't get, didn't get suffrage in Britain until after the First World War. This was 300 years before that. So, so they moved from a society based on coercion to a society based on opportunity and incentives. So you're, ask, you're thinking to yourself, the US, this is that constitution, isn't that important? Yeah, the constitution was important, but the constitution was an outcome of a process of institution building which had already taken place in the 17th century in uh, Virginia. Okay? You're also thinking, hold on a second, that's an awful long time ago. He just mentioned 300 years. How can that possibly be relevant for anything? It's relevant, as we show in the first chapter, because the early way that colonial societies got organized in North America and South America was very, very persistent over time. So we show in the first chapter, we give a whole lot of examples of how this created what we call a path-dependent process of institutions, political and economic institutions. I'm going to be more precise about that in a second, which goes all the way up to today. Think about how Bill Gates and Carlos Slim made their money, probably the two richest people in the world. Bill Gates made his money through innovation. Okay? He wanted to be a monopolist. Of course he did. Everybody wants to be a monopolist. It's in Adam Smith. Read the, Welsh ne read the Wealth of Nations. Adam Smith says, you, can't get, you get a few businessmen in a room and they come up with some plan to defraud the public. Okay? That's just a natural human impulse. The thing in the United States is this thing called antitrust that got Bill Gates under control. So one, he made his fortune by innovating. Two, when he tried to become a monopolist, he ran in front of antitrust. In Mexico, how did Carlos Slim make his money? through uh, negotiation and networks with politicians through insider privatization and monopoly. Carlos Slim is a clever, brilliant businessman, but he's operating in a different environment. And in Mexico, the reward is not to innovating, it's to creating monopolies and forming clientelistic networks with politicians. That's very, very telling about the different nature of those societies, and that has deep roots in uh, history. Okay. So let me try to abstract some principles or some basic concepts from this discussion. You know, there's, I'm sort of developing this dichotomy here. There's some historical development path of the United States and there's some historical development path of Latin America. And I'm going to put terminology onto this dichotomy. The dichotomy is sort of 
overly simplified, but I think it's useful for developing the argument. Okay? So, and I want to come back to this first discussion of the Industrial Revolution and, and how ideas and a very wide and energy and talent is very broadly distributed in society. What the United States did in that early days in Virginia, not by design, but as a sort of outcome of the equilibrium that arose in this early colonial society, was it created a situation where there was very widespread uh, economic opportunity and incentives. That was the model that the Virginia company, in the end, tried to set up. Uh, something very different happened in Latin America with coerced labor, enormous restrictions uh, on economic opportunity and lack of incentives for the vast mass of population, monopolies, uh, all sorts of things. So we want to say what's crucial for prosperity, as I emphasized at the start with, is this ability to harness this talent. And we're going to say whether or not a society can do that depends on its institutions, the rules that govern the economy, that create economic incentives or opportunities. So I'm going to call the type of economic institutions or rules that harness this potential inclusive economic institutions. You see where this word inclusive comes from, inclusive economic institutions. And I'm going to call the other sort, the type of economic institutions they had in colonial Guatemala or colonial Colombia, extractive. Okay, so inclusive economic institutions, extractive economic institutions. Let me give you my favorite example of extractive economic institutions. Apartheid South Africa. So uh, until 1994, when uh, Nelson Mandela became president in South Africa, there was an, this apartheid system. And the apartheid system was many things. Uh, but one thing it was, was a massive system of exploitation of black people. In 1913, uh, the government passed what's called the Native Land Act. The Native Land Act said 93% of the economy is the white economy and 7% is for Africans. Africans were probably about 85% of the population in 1913. They get 7%. The whites get 93%. This is the white economy. In the white economy, black people couldn't own assets or property. They couldn't run a business or start a business. Uh, they couldn't undertake any skilled profession. In fact, there was something called the color bar. The color bar was a huge list of things that only white people could do. Bricklayer, boilermaker, cooper, lawyer, doctor, accountant. So black people had, what could they do? They could work as unskilled laborers in mines or farms. They had very few opportunities or economic incentives. Okay? This created the world's most unequal society, but it was very similar to colonial societies in other parts of the world, in Latin America, for example. And South Africa and Zimbabwe, by the way, were created by English people, you know, which is an interesting fact also. So this was a huge system of economic regulation, extractive economic institutions, rules, which enormously restricted what black people could do, achieve, or aspire to. Okay? So that simultaneously undermined the prosperity of the society. Okay? So this is the basic idea. Uh, that's the extractive institutions. Similar in many ways, different in details to what went on in colonial South America, but, 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 but in, important in very similar ways, which are critical for prosperity. Okay, so the basic story of the book, or the first part of the story, is why is it that some countries are poor today and others are rich? It's because countries that are rich tend to have inclusive economic institutions, which have this property that I described, while poor countries have extractive economic institutions. Where, why did this enormous inequality emerge in the, in the last 300 years in the modern world? Because most countries historically had extractive economic institutions, and some made a transition to inclusive economic institutions, and that generated prosperity while others didn't. Fine. So, why is it that some countries have extractive economic institutions and others have inclusive? And how come some made a transition to inclusive economic institutions in the modern world and others didn't? And that's the most interesting part of the book. And that's about politics. Go back to the South African example. How come you know, the Native Land Act got passed? How come the color bar came in which said all these occupations are for white people and not black people? 
That was fundamentally about politics. That wasn't some Harvard economist who came to South Africa and said, you know, I've just written this really cool paper about what makes a country develop, and what you need is something like the color bar. That's really going to have a big impact in this country. No, this had nothing to do with ideas. It was about power. It was about the power of white people in many colonial societies to create a system of economic and political rules which favored them at the expense of the vast mass of the population. That's how the Spanish a colonial empire ran. That's how the British colonial empire ran. That was the model the British had in North America. It just didn't work. They had a similar model in Australia, by the way, and it broke down for not dissimilar reasons. So, so, so this is about power. It's about politics. So lying behind different sets of economic institutions are fundamentally structures of political power. So we talk about we make a similar dichotomy that lying behind inclusive economic institutions are inclusive political institutions and lying behind extractive economic institutions are extractive political institutions. And we emphasize two things about inclusive political institutions. One is, you know, you could think about the South African case is a sufficiently broad distribution of political rights in society or political power in society. The other is a centralized state. We call this political centralization. So to have inclusive political institutions, you need these two dimensions. And the book emphasizes that this is what leads to inclusive economic institutions. So let me give you some motivation for that. Where does this state centralization idea come from? Well, in the book, we motivate it by talking about uh, the Somali society. So Somalia was a, a part of the world in the, in the Horn of Africa where, where, which traditionally had no centralized political authority. The most famous ethnography of the Somali clans uh, by a Welsh social anthropologist called Yon Lewis is called A Pastoral Democracy. The title is very significant because what Lewis shows is that actually Somali clans, that Somalia was sort of separated into six large clan uh, territories, all of whom traced their ancestry back to a mythical founder called Somal. Uh, Clans made, male members of clans made very democratic decisions about what to do, okay? There were no politicians, no bureaucrats, no police, no lawyers, no judges, but the clans collectively made decisions. The male members of the clans collectively made decisions about what to do. But what Lewis shows in most of the book is that what they made decisions about what to do was feuding, blood feuds, who to attack, who to retaliate against. So, so this society, this stateless society, this democratic stateless society didn't lead to inclusive anything. It just led to a perpetual state of warfare and conflict. So having a central, uh, uh, what we call a political centralization is critical for providing basic public goods like order, for example, which you're never, without which you're never going to have any kind of economic development, and you need an entity which can enforce inclusive institutions, which can enforce inclusive rules. It's not enough to have them, they need to be enforced, and the state is critical for that. So that's part, that's a key part of this. And, you know, the broad distribution of political power, that's also, you know, that's also critical. How is it that you have, uh, you know, think about South Africa in 1994. South Africa moved uh, from a narrow distribution of political rights to a much broader distribution of political rights. The types of economic institutions under apartheid, like the color bar, couldn't possibly be sustained after political power had been broadened because pe people will use their political rights to challenge these institutions that favored some narrow subset of the society. Okay, so, inclusive and extractive economic institutions lying behind them inclusive and extractive political institutions. A lot of the book emphasizes uh, how persistent these combinations of institutions are. Think about my description of the Americas. I started by telling you a story 500 years ago how in the colonial period there was this divergence between these different types of institutions in North America and South America. And once they got set up, they were very persistent. So we emphasize a lot that these combinations tend to be very persistent. Once society gets set up in a particular way, whether it be extractive or inclusive, there's lots of feedback loops that tend to lead those particular organizations to persist. Nevertheless, you can make a transition from extractive to inclusive and vice versa. And you can also have societies with this odd combination of extractive, inclusive, 
political and economic. What's some examples of that? China is an example of that, okay? What do we say about China? Well, China, I'm sort of emphasizing inclusive political institutions, inclusive economic institutions. Uh, what about China? How does China fit into that? Hmm, Communist Party, that doesn't sound very inclusive. So that must be extractive political institutions. You know, even this far, we kind of must have figured that out. So extractive institutions, but hold on, China's doing well, so his theory must be all wrong. You know, well, I'm not going to give in that quickly. How do we think about China? Many other cases like that. There's many experiences in world economic history of countries experiencing economic growth with this sort of mismatch between economic and political institutions. And what we emphasize in the book is that uh, this is quite possible for transitory periods of time, but it's fundamentally unstable, okay? So what happened in China to spur economic growth in the 1970s? In the 1970s, China was an incredibly poor a technologically backward uh, economy, okay? Uh, they started moving economic institutions under Deng Xiaoping in a more inclusive direction. What jump-started Chinese economic growth was the introduction of inclusive economic institutions in the rural economy. In the 1980s, that spread to uh, the industrial sector. This was all about creating incentives and opportunities before that. This wasn't the genius of the Communist Party. This was the Communist Party retreating from trying to control every aspect of people's lives. So moving towards a more inclusive economy spurred very rapid economic growth, the capture, the, the kind of what economists call catch-up growth. So adopting technology and rapidly accumulating capital, reallocating people from the countryside who are, being, who are very unproductive, sticking them in a factory, raising productivity, same way that Stalin did, a bit kind of more user-friendly than the way Stalin did it, but same sort of principle, okay? Uh, so what we are emphasize is that there's many experiences like this in world economic history. We call this extractive uh, economic growth. But it's unsustainable under this type of uh, combination of institutions. It's the same the other way around. You know, you can have apartheid had extractive economic institutions and extractive political institutions. Once you move to inclusive political institutions, that combination of extractive economic and inclusive political was just unstable. That inclusive political institutions forced economic institutions to become more inclusive. The other off-diagonal is also unstable, okay? So what do I mean by unstable? Well, there's lots of different scenarios you can tell about this instability. There's lots of different ways it could pan out, okay? So one way it could pan out is that, you know, uh, as uh, Lord Acton said, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. What we do know is Chinese political elites are enormously enriching themselves and their family uh, by predating uh, on the economy, you know, as we speak. Uh, and that's something that could exacerbate and, you know, drive economic progress, you know, down, okay? So one scenario of which there's many examples in world uh, history, economic history, is just it, you can't control this power and it will lead to enormous predation on the economy and slowdown in economic growth. Just as likely is the fact that uh, this is very destabilizing, politically destabilizing. So in the book, we emphasize this, what we call creative destruction, that technological change and economic dynamism redistributes income, wealth, political power, and this is a very destabilizing process. You know, why is it that you know, in North Korea they don't try to go down the same road? Because they just don't feel they're going to be able to control it. Okay? So that's another trade-off that the Chinese regime will uh, face. So I don't want to go, I just describe the theory about that. Okay. So, uh, so we try to talk about these dynamics, historical dynamics, and about contemporary societies that have made a transition from extractive to inclusive. You can see that that's very difficult to do, but it can be done. So let me end by talking about a little bit about the Arab Spring, which introduces one more, the last element of this dynamics, which is important. Okay? So we emphasize a lot in the book conflict over institutional structures and institutional change. It's pretty obvious in South Africa, you know, just as it wasn't an economist who came along and said, you know, uh, uh, gosh, this color bar is a really good idea for developing the economy. It wasn't some Harvard professor who came along and said, you know, I have a dear colleague of mine, Michael Sandel, who some of you may know, who's uh, very into, like, justice. 
So it wasn't Michael who came along to the apartheid regime in South Africa and said, you know, it's really not fair the way you're treating all these black people. It was the fact, just like in the US South in the 1950s with the civil rights movement, it was the collective organization and mobilization of black people starting in the 1970s with the Soweto uprising that was the death knell for apartheid in South Africa. In the same way as the civil rights movement was the death knell for apartheid in the US South. It was politics, it was a shift in political power that forced this to change. Uh, and that's true in the Arab Spring, okay? It was collective mobilization for the people who suffered under the extractive institutions of President Mubarak with his crony capitalists that forced President Mubarak from power, okay? So conflict is important. But what's also clear, obviously clear from historical examples is that conflict over institutions doesn't necessarily lead from an extractive to an inclusive society. After all, Latin America is the continent of revolution. I told a story about the continuity in Latin America, and I even talked about Mexico. But Mexico had a revolution, of course. Mexico had civil wars in the 19th century. It had a revolution uh, around about the time of the First World War. So shouldn't that revolution have led to inclusive institutions? Of course, it didn't. What the revolution led to was a coalition of warlords in the 1920s who got themselves together and called themselves the PRI. The per well, actually, they didn't call themselves the PRI until the 1940s, but they, called, they made a part, they created a one-party state. The, these warlords who had come out of the Mexican Revolution alive and victorious, okay? So this was not an inclusive society that emerged. It was the circulation of what Pareto called the circulation of elites, or what we call in the book the iron law of oligarchy. Actually, it's a, it's a coin phrase by a famous German sociologist called Robert Michels. I've never been quite sure how you pronounce that, but I'm going to definitively learn that today. So Robert Michels coined this term. Actually, he was very, he was very outraged at how the socialists had supported Germany's entry into the First World War. And so he was trying to explain how they'd been captured by the powers that be and how new elites were captured by the traditional elites. But also he describes this process of elite circulation. So this is crucial to understand. Think about Egypt and how people are talking about Egypt. Everybody's worried that now Mubarak has disappeared, he'll be replaced by the Muslim Brotherhood. So this won't be an inclusive or different type of society. It will be Mubarak 2.0. It will be a different group on top, different face, maybe different instruments, but it won't be a fundamentally inclusive society. It'll be an extractive society in a different guise. Okay? And there's many, many examples of that. We talk a lot about that in the book. So what is it that makes the difference between a conflict that leads to the reproduction of an extractive society in a different guise or a conflict that leads to a new inclusive society. And the concept we use in the book is what we call a broad coalition. Okay? So let me motivate that and then I'll shut up. So what's a broad coalition? Well, this is a very empirical thing. What determines whether or not a conflict seems to lead from extractive to inclusive is the nature of the people in the conflict. If you look at uh, the Glorious Revolution in 1688 in Britain that we point to as being fundamental in leading to a more inclusive set of political institutions in Britain, which then subsequently laid the foundations for the Industrial Revolution, what you see is that the Glorious Revolution was fundamentally a kind of the derailment of the sort of absolutist political project that was, being, that was sort of underway at that time. So King James II was kicked out of power. And there was a civil war in which a very broad, heterogeneous group of people were organized against him. People from across the political spectrum, from the nascent political parties, the Whigs and the Tories at the time, landowners, mercantile groups, all sorts of people were organized against him. Why is that important? Well, I'll give you a very specific example. One thing James II was doing was really irritating people, was intervening in legal cases. So some judge ruled in some way he didn't like, he'd intervene and fire them. Okay? This, was, this was annoying people. So this was a big sense of grievance. Now, imagine we're trying to start a revolution. Okay? So I'm, I'm in charge, and you're, my, you're, you're the potential revolutionaries. Now, I need to get you mobilized and out, and out on the street. What could I do? Well, one thing I could do is I could say, you know, when we're in power, we're going to get the legal decisions we want. You know, he's getting the legal decisions he likes now, but when we're in power, we'll get what we want. Okay? Now, 
that's a viable thing if there's just a small, what, you know, what Lenin might have called a vanguard party. You know? So we're in the right place for me to talk about vanguard parties. So I'll talk about vanguard parties. You know, the Bolshevik Revolution, what was that? That was a kind of coup d'etat, in some sense, by a very narrow group of people. So, so, but the more and more people I have to appeal to, I can't offer selective favors to everybody. Okay? If I have to appeal to a broad coalition of people in society, I can't, I can't behave in this way favor to everybody. So what can I do instead? Well, I can say, well, well, we're very aggrieved at this intervention in the legal system by James II. So what we're going to do is we'll, ha everybody, we'll have equality before the law. We'll have a level playing field. Nobody's going to get discriminated against. Maybe that's not quite so powerful for mobilizing some people, but that's what you're going to have to do to mobilize a lot of people because you can't use this very selective way of mobilizing people. And that's exactly what we show in the book, which is that after the Glorious Revolution, this notion of basically the rule of law or equality before the law emerged as a consequence of the strategies that people had developed in order to contest power with James II. So I hope that's a sort of very tangible example of what we mean by this broad uh, coalition. You know, when does a broad coalition form and will it form in Egypt? And we don't really have a theory about that. <laughs> but but <laughs> that's, that's, that's where we are. So uh, I hope I, I probably said too much. Uh, so, so I think I've given some idea of what the basic ideas are and how we use them. And, and uh, so let me shut up. I must introduce myself very briefly again. Professor Rochel said I'm the correspondent for the Financial Times here in Berlin. Um, and you've given me a very challenging job to do because your, your, your canvas is so huge. Uh, I mean, an extraordinary book, the sort of book one would die to have the opportunity to write. But actually, you're, it's a very brave and maybe quite foolhardy book to to really go for such a big... So what I want to do, and I want to involve uh, the audience here as much as possible in a debate, I assume we've got till 8 o'clock, Professor Rahul? Yeah. Um, and uh, is, is really bring your thinking into the world that we're living in very much and say, OK, well, using that theory, what's going to happen? Which is what you've just bulked on the Arab Spring. So I won't start with the Arab string. Yeah. I'll start with the BRICS. Let's look at Brazil, Russia, India, China. Mm -hmm. Here we have four countries that are really uh, a pretty disparate group, but are all between them, in a way, representing the explosion of the emerging markets. And what have we got? Fundamentally, two overwhelmingly extractive countries, and two that are far more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Russia and China still essentially extractive, India and Brazil inclusive. Your theory would predict that the great successes are going to be India and Brazil. Looking at them today, yeah. I would think it's going to be China. Yeah. So that's exactly right. I mean, I think that Russia, Russia is an example of a failed transition to an inclusive society in the 1990s. You know, this is a, the, the collapse of the Soviet regime and the transition to a democratic society was not a broad-based political movement at all. It was something going on in Moscow. And the, and the, and the, the attempt, the, some, you know, the somewhat serious attempt to create a more inclusive model collapsed in the face of political, you know, chicanery, I would say. You know, so, 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 so this, was a, this was a failed attempt to make a, a transition to an, an inclusive society, and I would say it's very extractive. You know, the, what works in Russia is natural resource extraction. You know, it's, it's the wealth and economic growth is based on oil and natural resources. And, and, and uh, you know, and the Chinese case, you know, I would say uh, this is, uh, you know, well, I talked a lot about that, you know, that, that this is not a stable situation. India is a sort of gray, you know, gray area in the sense that... One of the arguments yeah. the Indians use is we're the Democrats, therefore, in the long yeah. run, we're going to work better. It's a very imperfect type of democracy. So, so in the book, we kind of avoid... We talk about inclusive politi political institutions. You know, we talk about, you know, 
inclusive economic and extractive because we want to try to use different terminology. You know, if I want to talk about the difference between South Korea and North Korea, I think the important distinction is not capitalism and socialism, it's this inclusive and extractive. And I think that's the thing about democracy as well, that some sorts of democracies can be very non-inclusive. You know, in India, it's enormously corrupt. There's, very, there's a huge amount of vote buying and clientelism. Uh, there's enormous sort of populist tendencies as well. So I would say it's very imperfect, the Indian uh, democracy. And economic inclusion is also very imperfect. Think about the caste system. You know, the caste system must count as sort of the world's most institutionalized extractive institution that blocks opportunity and incentives. But nevertheless, I would say, you know, if you ask me, you know, which of the two countries, China or Brazil, had a kind of institutional setup which was most likely to be persistent and successful in the long run, I'd say by far India. You know, in what India has done something really amazing which people never talk about, which is how surprising it is that such a thing exists. India is this enormously heterogeneous linguistically, ethnically, historically subcontinent. You know, China hasn't even, you know, solved that problem, I don't think, with a workable political system. So, so you know, the Indians managed to create this workable thing and create a social contract and an identity and it's lots of imperfections but that's a quite an astonishing achievement. Brazil we talk about at the end of the book as being a case of a very interesting transition to more inclusive economic institutions as a consequence of the democratization in the 1980s and we speculate as to whether you know what is the broad coalition in Brazil and does you know we talk about the application of this idea and in it, Brazil. And it fits yeah. your model to the extent that in taking this transition to democracy and away from military rule, yeah. it really has opened up the economy dramatically. Right, That's but that is a particular sort of transition. You know, the, tran the, the transition to democracy you know, in Venezuela didn't have the same, <laughs> didn't have the same impact. So it's, it's not just a transition to democracy, it's what type of democracy you get. It's, you know, it, it, it's, that, that's absolutely crucial and that, in our view, is to do with the type of movement that fought for democracy in Brazil, that's very different from many of these other Latin American cases. Okay, but now, I mean, take your book. Is it the sort of book that should be making a European audience feel good at night? Definitely, Because yes. we're inclusive, Definitely. we're all right, don't worry, the world out there. And yet, well, if you're sitting in Europe, you feel we are getting worse and worse at making decisions, we are moving very slowly, demography is all wrong, all the other things that you're rather dismissive of are going wrong. Well, I wouldn't say, I mean, I think that, you know, there's never room for complacency, right? You know, what is it that makes institutions work and persist? And that's human beings. You know, human beings have to work to defend institutions, to make them work better, to make them flourish, to, you know, so, so human, you know, it's human beings that make the system work. You know, of course, in any particular set of institutions, human beings operate with a particular set of expectations about how other people are going to behave, about how the rules are going to be enforced, and, you know, so, so, so people's energies are channeled in particular direction in the same way Bill Gates' energies were channeled in a different way from Carlos Slim. But I don't think there's any rule for complacency. You know, we, 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 we give examples in the book historically, from the case of the United States in particular, about how institutions historically have been challenged many times in the US. You know, but the idea with inclusive institutions is that there's sort of feedback. There's feedback that tends to lead to inclusive institutions persisting over time. So, you know, if I'm going to take all the countries in the world and I'm going to put them in one of two bins, extractive or inclusive, obviously European countries are going to be in the inclusive uh, bin. Uh, and I, you know, I think that, you know, uh, inclusiveness is something that's deepened enormously, you know, uh, in, in Europe in the, in, after the Second World War, that the European Union has played an incredibly positive role in promoting inclusive institutions, you know, not just in southern Europe, in Iberia, but also in eastern Europe and in the Baltic states. You know, it just seems to me that, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I don't know where all this European pes Euro pessimism comes from. I, I'd say that, you know, uh, any type of economy uh, is, a private enterprise economy is prone to instability. You know, innovation uh, goes along with instability. You know, a lot of the financial crisis is caused by the fact that people come up with new financial ideas, you know, innovations, new securities, assets, 
uh, derivatives, you know, uh, securitization. It's a clever idea. They can make money. Uh, it allows you to do things you couldn't do before. But it also has all sorts of unintended consequences, you know. Uh, so, you know, this is, a, this is a problem. It creates instability. The regulators don't understand it either. Their government is trying to catch up. That can create speculative bubbles. It can create crises. It creates huge amounts of, of pain and, 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 and welfare losses, unemployment. But I guess you, I would say you have to look at the big picture. You know, to me, the, you know, the European project has been enormously successful. Okay, you know, Cole and Mitterrand thought, well, we can't get everything we want, but we can do this monetary union thing, so let's go for it. And that created this strange combination of monetary union without fiscal union, and that created a lot of macroeconomic disequilibria. But I'd say, you know, and maybe that's part of the crisis too. Well, what's happening now? Well, people are trying to figure out a way of solving that problem. I mean, and I think, you know, that's going to be quite a consensual thing in the end. You know, think about Greece. You know, Greece is not benefiting from this incoherence. The Greeks are suffering enormously from the fallout from this particular model of how the EU worked. And so why wouldn't they want to find an institutional architecture which will stop this happening again? You know, so, so, so I, I, I don't Greece know. is still essentially an extractive... Uh... I, you know, I'm not going to deny that there's differences between Northern Europe and Southern Europe. But think about the story you know, we have in the book you know, about the emergence of inclusive institutions in, I didn't get into this very much, in, you know, in, 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 in Europe and, 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 well, this is happening in the early modern period. Uh, the Atlantic economy opens up, trade, uh, developed mercantile institutions. What's happening in Greece? It's part of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire is something like colonial Latin America. It's this very patrimonial, emp uh, uh, a very patrimonial political system. You know, uh, you know Greece is, trapped in a kind of aspic in a very different world than uh, the rest of Europe in that period. Mm. So I would say, you know, these problems with Greek politics, clientelism, patrimonial state, you could say, okay, the EU should have sorted that out, and it didn't. But the EU didn't create that. That's something much, much, much mm. deeper in the history of the society, it seems to me. All right. You're getting... You're, 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 I'm starting to get a little bit persuaded. I want to bring <laughs> in the audience as much as possible. So why don't you start sort of raising your hands or, or shouting at me, and I will keep going uh, also a little bit. Just before I come to you then, uh, uh, over there, Beth, I'm going to say, ask you one more thing. Yeah. Haven't you got the wrong title for the book? Isn't the real question not why nations fail, yeah. but why that much rarer thing do they succeed? Yeah, I, you know, that, the, the title, yeah, I mean, I, you may be right the about that. The norm is that, the extractive. But the, the, the title comes from the fact that, you know, this is a lot of the theoretical work that Daron and I have done uh, in economics and, and political science, which is that, you know, we've always thought, some economists think that success is sort of deeply puzzling. You know, they think that, oh, gosh, it's such a mystery, you know, how do we solve the problems of Sierra Leone? Whereas we've always seen this as being easy, you know, like... What do you need to make Sierra Leone more prosperous? Well, it would be nice if there was some electricity, uh, some roads. Uh, you know, it would be nice if there was any kind of infrastructure, if the schools had teachers, and if the schools had books or maybe roofs on them. Uh, you know, just like basic things, education, infrastructure, you know, functioning government, uh, rule of law, uncorrupt legal system. You know, this is, we, this is easy. You know, this is, you know, I don't know how to turn Sierra Leone into a kind of manufacturing miracle but I know how to take it from GDP per capita of $500 to $10,000. So we've always thought this bit's easy. You know, the difficult bit is understanding why is it that this society can't exploit these very easy things it, everyone knows how to do. Look at electricity. You know, uh, there's no electricity in Sierra Leone you know, or North Korea. Well, in the, if you look at North Korea at night, you'll see there's some power mm. in the presidential compound in Pyongyang. But apart from that, we've known how to... Electricity is a very easy-to-use technology. It's been around for 130... This is not rocket science to use electricity. Why is it not used? You know, so, so we've always thought failure was the puzzling thing. We've done a lot of theoretical work trying to understand the politics and the institutional structures that create failure. And I guess that's, that's where well, the title can. comes okay. from. Yeah. Right. Beth Pond, over there. The um, microphone just behind you. Uh, I'd like to ask how many times you have been invited to China and what was your reception? Uh, uh, never. <laughs>
I mean, I've been to several conferences in China, academic conferences, but n never. I haven't known. Why not, do you think? No idea. <laughs> um, what do you think your reception would be like if you... I don't know. I, 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 the last time I gave a, I gave a talk at the um, uh, Peking University uh, about uh, five years ago, and it's very, very open. You know, I found it... I, sort of, I was very worried. I, I, saw, I talked to them. I was invited by Justin Lin, who was just the World Bank uh, chief economist, who's a professor there. And uh, I said, you know, I was very anxious about what can I say? You know, do I have to censor myself? I don't want to cause controversy. He said, no, you can say anything you like. It's a university. Uh, and it was very fun. I mean, I found the interaction very fun and interesting. But I, you know, but I, I, I didn't talk about China. <laughs> I've got a question to stand the aisle here. Stand up um, so we can see you. Hi. Uh, so. My, my puzzle is about your persistence. Can you just say who you are? Sorry, I'm sorry. Jay Bernstein from the American Academy. Right. Um, I'm puzzled about the persistence thesis. So my puzzle is, it's not clear to me why, when people become powerful, they don't change the rules in order to favor themselves, in order to make the economy more extractive. Indeed, that seems to be just what's happened in the United States and in Europe over the last 15 or 20 years. You claim there's a positive feedback loop, yeah. but the uh, evidence of the last 20 years is exactly not. <laughs> that the feedback is from an opportunity, from an inclusive to an extractive, given the opportunity to do so. So I don't understand where the thesis of the persistence of a good feedback comes from and why you don't think that there is a natural tendency yeah. to go from inclusive to extractive. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't agree with this characterization of economic institutions in Europe and uh, United States. I, you know, I think, you know, in the United States, there's a severe concern that increasing inequality is leading to a sort of oligarchization of politics and making the political system much less uh, accountable and much less inclusive. And you know, I think we can we can we can debate that. You know, uh, I don't see any evidence in the United States. You know, you could make an argument about the financial sector, but I don't see any evidence in the private sector that industry is becoming oligarchized or riven by monopolies or entry barriers. I see the private sector in the US as being still very dynamic and competitive, you know. Uh, so, so, and I, I mean, I'm not an expert on uh, Europe, uh, but, but Britain, which is a, a country I'm a citizen of and I know something about, I don't see that that's any different in Britain than it's always been. There's always been a sort of banking cartel in Britain going back, you know, for as long as, back probably to the 17th century. Uh, but, you know, I don't see the private sector. If anything, the private sector has become much more dynamic. You know, now Britain is an exporter of cars for the first time for 30 years. Britain now export cars. That's because... The They're car Japanese cars. Uh, Britain exports Japanese and German cars. Well, they've imported human capital and expertise, the Tatas. The Tatas have come. That's fine. You know, that's, 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 that's gains from trade and comparative advantage, you know. So that's the break. You know, why did that happen? Because that's extractive institutions in some parts of the British economy made it impossible to innovate. So they had to go bankrupt and new people had to come with different ways of doing things and different ideas and, and business strategies. And that's, that's creative destruction in action. So, so I don't, you know, if you ask me, you know, you're, what, you're, what you're describing is what happened in Tunisia. You know, when President Ben Ali took over in 1987 in Tunisia, he took over a project, you know, which was quite an inclusive project under President Bourguiba. You know, President Bourguiba expanded education. He wanted to create a Tunisian identity. He had a project, you know, like Lee Kuan Yew had a project, or, you know, like President Mahathir had a project. Even President Marcos in the Philippines had a project, some people claim. But what happened in, the, in, in Tunisia is, is very interesting because that was, again, this combination of inclusivity in the economy in many dimensions with extractive political institutions. What happened when President Bourguiba was pushed aside and President Ben Ali came in, his, start, his family started looting the economy. So, 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 you know, this is what happens when you have unconstrained power. And, you know, that's another place of instability. So, you know...
There's a yeah, question in the middle here. Well, we've got more than one question. Yeah, that gentleman there. Hi, I'm Michael Leviton, American journalist. Uh, I'd like you to talk a little more about your idea of the broad coalition that you started on. And in speaking to the fracturing, essentially the fracture that is occurring now with Southern Europe, essentially every country in Southern Europe now uh, taking on, you might not want to call it a revolutionary um, aspect, but certainly the majorities, vast majorities of the population not agreeing with the policies and the direction of the governments from Portugal to Spain, right across uh, even Slovenia, Bulgaria, Greece, and now Italy with a new party. It's evident. So can you talk about what you see when populations do, as you, as you cited the, the glorious revolution, build a broad coalition? In our era, the elites and those in power seem not to be listening to the people regardless of a majority voicing opposition to policies that are being pushed on populations. So how do you see that broad coalition uh, manifesting in something that actually brings about more livable existence for the many people. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to, you know, by being optimistic about the sort of European project, I don't want to, I don't want to de-emphasize the short-run costs of, you know, economic crisis. But I think, you know, if you think about the Spanish case, you know, what is it that creates, what is that, you know, fundamentally that created this crisis? You know, it's, it's a sort of speculative bubble in real estate, you know. Now you could say that's an enormous failure of regulation. You know what happens when a speculative bubble occurs? So, so house price, there's a huge boom in house prices. The financial industry starts lending lots of money to buy house prices, that bids up house prices. Construction starts, construction drives up wages, it sucks resources from workers, capital from the rest of the economy. Then the whole thing crashes. You know, you can't, those people are unemployed. You know, people's houses are taken back. You know, there's enormous discontent in society. You know, you could, that's a massive failure of regulation of the financial sector of, but you know, I don't have some Machiavellian theory of that really. I just think that that's a cre created, so cre created perhaps by some extent perverse incentives, you know, within the financial sector in the sense that the financial sector is too big to fail. And they know that so they can engage in, you know, too speculatively or too risky activities from a social point of view, you know. So, okay, so this is a, this is a you know, to me that, that's, that, that's a, that says nothing, that doesn't reflect on the viability or kind of sense of the project of the EU and European integration. It just means you have to find a way of learning from that experience of trying to stop that happening again, of regulating the financial industry or whatever it is, or finding a different monetary policy or, or you know. So, as I said, you know, I think that stability, instability is a part of innovation, be it in the financial sector or in, or in the other sectors of the economy. You know, I, as I, I'd say the same about Greece. You know, I don't see what is the, you know, in this case, I'm not sure it is a matter of a broad coalition because I think that Spain has fundamentally inclusive institutions. It has fundamentally inclusive economic and political institutions. It's a matter of sort of the society identifying what's in its collective interest. I understand that in the short run, this is enormously painful, you know, having to bear all of this wage cutting, cuts in public expenditure, people losing their houses. This is very, very, you know, it's very socially destructive and it's very bad for people's lives. But it seems to me that the, the, cor the, the correct reaction to that, you know, or the socially desirable reaction is to recognize that the fundamentals of society are, 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 are good and it's just a matter of adjusting to this, you know, which is painful. And that's about, you know, who pays for that as well is an important issue. So, so it's a, there's also a distributional issue as well as a, a kind of welfare issue. So, you know, I understand that in situations like that, you can get very dysfunctional type of politics can arise, populist politics or whatever. But I, I, I mean, my impression, if you take the Greek case, you know, perhaps I'm not understanding what's going on well enough, but my sense in the Greek case is, is that the voters recognized that they were going to have to adjust to this situation. What else do you do? Take, get out of the EU? You know, Greek people would be much worse off if they got out of the EU. Devalued 
their currency becomes worthless, they lose all of these connections. I mean, this is not a sensible future for any of these countries, it seems to me. But you've put your finger on, I think, uh, a very interesting difference between Greece and Spain, yeah. where in, in, in Greece the real problem is that the institutions do not exist to actually provide a sustainable solution, that they are still locked in this sort of post-Ottoman uh -huh. stasis, whereas Spain had moved much further to have viable institutions. Yeah. So the real challenge in Greece is actually to build those institutions. It's not just an economic challenge, it's a, an institutional one, right. um, which I think is very interesting. I've got a question on the edge. I want to put something to you first. I want to come back to the grand coalition idea. And where does the bourgeoisie fit into this? Because I was in Russia in the perestroika years, and I remember uh, feeling very much that once there was... Uh, a, a real bourgeoisie who had an interest in, um, in property rights and so on, you would get much more of an unstoppable force towards it. It hasn't really happened. Even the oligarchs didn't become a great force for saying, now, let's, now we've stolen yeah. all our property, let's preserve it with good property laws. They just took their money out to Cyprus or wherever it yeah. may be. Yeah. So where does the bourgeoisie, the social change, fit in with the institutional change? Well, I, you know, I think that's part of the, the, that's an important part of the story. You know, people say there is a middle class emerging now in Russia, but it seems to me that it's, it's, it's very dependent on the state. It's dependent on access to it's state. a very rules. strangely defined middle class, I think, you know, one motor car and a couple of televisions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, 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 you know, having a middle class, which is, you know, what's crucial about the British case, for example, is that, a, a, a middle class, you know, or a mercantile bourgeoisie emerged, which was autonomous, completely autonomous from the mm. state. In fact, it fought tooth and nail against the state to make itself autonomous in the early, in the first half of the 17th century, and to stop the state trying to predate on it. And it was not, a, it was not a middle class or a mercantile class that was that was, you know, reliant on state favours or state monopolies or state patronage. It was, a, it was an autonomous, and that was a very big political battle in England, the statute of monopolies from Elizabethan England right the way through to the Civil War. I mean, I, we don't emphasise so much the middle class per se uh, in the book. I think, you know, that, that, you know, if you look at the, take the, uh, take the Brazilian transition, you know, one of the things that was crucial in the Brazilian transition is not the middle class, but the working class, but the workers' party. Now, of course, the workers' party is a very heterogeneous party, but the workers' party started with a strike wave by unionists against the military dictatorship. And that was a sort of a, something that precipitated this creation of a much broader interest of intellectuals, of you know, middle class people in Sao, Sao, Paulo, Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. And so, so I, th I, I think that's an important part of it, but I, I, it's not emphasise that much in the book. Okay, so. I've got one question on the edge up here at the front, and then I've got two at the back. Hi. There's a microphone yes, right behind you. you. Tell us who you are. I'm Dieter Baumeister, a retired civil servant of Berlin and a friend of Leslie Collett. Uh, today I read in a paper that in Europe won't run one million e-cars at the end of the decade to 1920, uh, 2020. Now, I ask you, you, you agree with me that Germany is a relatively successful nation within Europe, but I ask you whether Germany is not maybe an, a country which belongs to your ex, extractive, extractiving um, societies because uh, Germany exploits maybe its capacity to build big cars to export and um, uh, inclusive society would, after your ideas, find ideas how to make uh, cars for the future. So maybe 
a successful nation can also be a ex ex attractive society. But you're, you're worried about the consequences of this for the environment. Is that the question? Is that, is that why you're, you're worried about the environmental consequences of this? Or are you saying that in order to get environmental progress, you need to have a more autocratic government, that actually no, maybe um, we're not going to do it? I, 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 I think that would be necessary to have new ideas. You started your lecture very well with saying it's good to have innovating ideas, uh, and, and I agree with you. But uh, in Europe, maybe the innovating ideas are not too, too big. We dwell on the things we have. We have achieved a lot, and that makes lazy, maybe. <laughs> and so, I so I, I mean I think that you know some you know a lot of people could legitimately criticise the book as being too focused on economic development and what about you know that 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 many people believe that this model of economic development we've had over the last 200 years is something which is completely kind of unsustainable in the face of you know deterioration of the climate or finite resources or so you know I think those are enormously important. Uh, issues, particularly, you know, global warming and the enormous externalities from economic activity for the climate. But I would say, you know, is that what, what type of society is most likely to solve those problems or be able to negotiate with each other and, you know, devise a sort of collectively dis ra rational solution? I would think that was societies with inclusive institutions. I wouldn't have much faith that, you know, the dictatorship in North Korea or Uzbekistan or wherever it is is going to be able to make any kind of socially desirable choice for the society they, they govern, you know. So, so you know, I, so I, I, I would say that, yes, these are big political problems that the world faces, you know, but I would say that if any type of society was likely to be able to solve those problems in a rational way and get together to do something about it, it would be it, it will be inclus those with inclusive political institutions. We've got a, uh, the mic friends with somebody there at the back. Yep, yep, you. If you've got a mic, go good, for it. Good evening. Um, I'm a student from the Freie Universität Berlin, and I'm working on something that, um, that um, is very closely related to um, the topic of your book. Um, it's a link between political pluralism and innovation. And um, empirically speaking, I think they're very highly correlated. Now, the area that interests me is Eastern Europe after 1990s. In Russia, for example, at the beginning of the transition period, there was a multi-party political system that had more than 100 political parties enlisted for voting um, for number of votes. Do you think that um, the higher the political party system, the more innovations will come and the higher growth will be generated? Do you think it is a question of time? And do you think that there is an ideal number of political parties? <laughs> Thank there, you very much. Somebody else close by at the back. Why okay. don't I get a second question? All right. If you can just keep, yep, here we go. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Mirko Homa and I'm a student at the Hertz School of Governance here in Berlin. And as Russia was already a touched upon, um, you mentioned earlier and you said one of the reasons that they failed to actually establish inclusive institutions was because of the extraction of natural resources. And talking about the so-called resource curse, I was wondering whether in your research you, you were actually able to establish a link between the existence of uh, natural resources and the establishment of extractive institutions. Thank you. Can you handle this? Yeah, absolutely, yes. So, I don't think there's any desirable number of political parties. You know, I think that the number of political parties tends to reflect incentives in the electoral system. For example, the British system that you have in the United, this majoritarian system you have in the United States tends to naturally generate two-party political competition, whereas the type of proportional representation system you have in Germany allows multiple parties to flourish. I would see that as pretty unimportant relative to other things. I mean, I think, you know, that, that, that I wouldn't say that, that 
type of electoral system, that type of difference generates different sorts of incentives and parties, I wouldn't see that as being a big uh, issue. I think, you know, in the Russian case, yes, you had this proliferation of political parties, but that was a sort of epiphenomena in some sense, you know, that it was soon snuffed out. And I would say, you know, the Russian case, you know, as in many cases in Eastern Europe, there's a lot of continuities, you know. I mean, in Russia, the, con the unfortunate continuity was there were still elements of the Soviet state and security apparatus that were still enormously powerful after the collapse of communism, which, pre which, which President Putin was able to utilize in a very interesting way. You know, the fact that the state got these oligarchs under control is something absolutely fascinating. You know, that would never happen in Mexico or Colombia. Uh, no, no, no way. Uh, so I don't think there's an optimal number of political parties, and I just think the whole, the whole nature of this political competition, if you look at these other, if you look at countries like Poland or Hungary, which actually had a sort of history of de democracy and sort of free elections and free politics, well, somewhat free, uh, between the First World War and the Second World War, there's actually a lot of continuities between what went on before the Second World War, before the sort of Iron Curtain fell, and what's happened since. So there's all sorts of continuities in terms of the politics and, uh, you know, in terms of the resource curse, I, I don't think, and this is what the book argues, that there really is a resource curse, except at particular historical instances. You know, so think about the Americas. I think, you know, at the time of the colonization of the Americas, the availability or otherwise of particular resources may be important for determining what type of society you get. But I think that's generally not relevant. You know, look at Venezuela. You know, to me, Venezuela looks like an absolutely normal Latin American country. You know, Venezuela has oil. You know, Colombia doesn't have oil. It sort of does now, but it hasn't had much in the past. You know, I just see all the similarities between Venezuela and Colombia, not the differences. You know, and that's because the structure of those society, the politics, that's all deeply rooted in some much more slower moving historical process. When oil came on stream in Venezuela in the 1920s, it really did not much to change that. And I, you know, I think that's generally the case. In the book, we give the examples of gold in Australia and diamonds in Sierra Leone. So I taught in Australia for two years, actually, at the University of Melbourne. So in Victoria, in Australia, where Melbourne is, there was a gold rush in the 1850s. And this was, this was gold was spread out all over the place. So it's not like something deep mined. There were thousands of people went off, diggers went off, you know, and started prospecting for gold with a shovel and a pan. Okay? Now, in Australia, this is like democratic gold. You know, this is, creates this democratic impulse. It creates the first part of the world which had an effective secret ballot. That's called the Australian ballot. That was introduced about five years after this gold rush started in Victoria. So what happened in Sierra Leone? You have the same resources, very similar. You know, diamonds, people go, shovel, pan, mining. What do you have in Sierra Leone? Blood diamonds. You don't have no democratic impulse. Why is that? Well, the intrinsic resource is very similar. But the way it was exploited was completely different. In Australia, you had this very open access. Thousands of people went out. They started digging. They got a claim. What happened in Sierra Leone in the early 1930s when they discovered diamonds? The British put a huge fence around the whole thing and gave the monopoly to the one company to exploit. That had very, very different social implications from the, the way that gold was exploited in Australia. So, so I... What, the way we talk about it in the book is the consequences of resources tend to be very conditional on the different types of institutions you have, and it's only at particular moments when resources can be, can be important. I fear we're running out of time. Now all the hands are starting to spring up. Um, we, let, me, let me just take, there was one question here. Is there a microphone, a gentleman, right? Yeah, stand up and uh, bring him a mic. And then I'll take two questions together, and then I fear we're going to have to wind up. So, nice short question, please. <clears throat> um, my name is Till Speransky. I'm from the Humboldt University of Berlin. My question is, so far you, you've talked about um, uh, foreign policy as an initial shock in economies, like the Spaniards in Southern America, or the English people in, in America, in North America. But you haven't talked about um, 
hegemonial influence in, 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 in current politics or in, in politics of the past, so what about it? Yeah. Hegemonial influence, as in... Yeah, America. regional, like, for example, Nicaragua with uh, the United States influencing, like, the econo economic just, development. There's only one hegemon, basically, yeah. it's America. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, I would, you know, I would have thought the recent experience in Iraq and Afghanistan has underlined how completely ineffectual the United States foreign policy is in, in determining, you know, what the world looks like. You know, both cases has been a complete failure of the plan to create some sort of, you know, Western-friendly pu you know, puppy dog, lap dog type of society. I mean, it's been a complete and utter failure. They just haven't recognized that yet in Afghanistan. I think you can find instances such as in Nicaragua or maybe Chile in the 1970s or Guatemala in the 1950s where the CIA came in and, you know, they did this or did that or they tried to encourage this side or that side. But I... I you know, we don't emphasize in the book that in the book because, because I just, you know, we just feel that that's not really first order. You know, if you look at the Chilean, Chilean dictatorship, okay, so this is one of the most famous examples. I mean, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the same would be true of, in Nicaragua, but okay, fine. So the Chilean military mounted a coup, you know, on September the 11th, 1973. They sort of, the CIA, you know, Henry Kissinger, Henry Kissinger is sort of back in fashion now, but back in the day, you know, he was waving on the Chilean military to mount a coup and shoot a few communists and trade unionists. Now, were the Americans cheering? Sure. But what was the real impact of that? You know, George W. Bush was cheering when the Venezuelans got rid of Chavez for 48 hours, and then Chavez bounced back, and, you know, then he just looked stupid. You know, my guess is that what real, you know, the real thing in Chile is this enormous conflict in society over the way the society was going to function. There was a socialist project of the government of Allende. There was enormous opposition to that in society from landowners, other type of interests. And that was what the conflict was about. The Americans came in kind of one side cheering and egging it on. But I, you know, if you'd taken the CIA out of that and, and, and pensioned Kissinger off or sent him back to Harvard, he used to be a professor at the Weatherhead Center. Before, it used to be called the Center for International Affairs before it was renamed the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. You know, anyway, Kissinger used to hang out there in the 1960s. So, so you know, they could have pensioned him off and sent him back to Harvard. The coup would have still happened, that's my guess. Maybe not, but I don't think that effect is big. So that's why we don't emphasize that sort of thing. I think we... we I'm talking we, too much, sorry. We, no, no, not, we have to wind up. I'm very sorry because there are lots of people who would like to come in now, but maybe afterwards you can get a few people running up. Um, I like to end with cock up rather than conspiracy. After a lifelong life as a journalist, I am convinced that cock up is far more common than conspiracy. <laughs> I want to finish with one little story of my own because you write a lovely piece in the book about one of my all-time favorite countries, and that is Botswana. Oh. I was correspondent in South Africa for five years, and I used to travel up to Botswana, and it was the moment of liberation when I got there. And that wonderful gentleman who you write about in the book, Kwek Masiri, was president. Uh -huh. And I went to interview him once, and he invited me and my colleague in, and he said, gentlemen, six o'clock, uh, would you like a drink? And we were very good, and we said, yeah, we'll have a Coke or Diet Coke or something equally. So he sent out a flunky to go and get us a Coke. And after about 10 minutes, this rather embarrassed flunky came back and said, excuse me, Mr. President, you've got the key to the cool drink cabinet. And I thought, <laughs> that is the definition of a civilized country. <laughs> so Botswana is my all-time civilized country. <laughs> Professor Robinson, thank you very much for your talk, for answering all those questions. Thanks to the audience, and thanks to those who arranged the meeting.